All right, today we're gonna to start a short but really, really extremely important block of the course called the harmonic oscillator. Now, this block is about small oscillations. The harmonic oscillator is a mathematical model that is A, simple, and B, explains a lot of phenomena of oscillations around equilibrium. The harmonic oscillator is applied all the way from, I don't know, from quantum mechanics and uh, molecular dynamics to cosmology and the structure of the universe. So the harmonic oscillator uh, is also applied to, you're gonna see in circuits, you probably are seeing it right now. RLC circuits are, are harmonic oscillators. Well, LC, LC circuits are frictionless harmonic oscillators. RLC circuits are full friction harmonic oscillators. This is an in, immensely important topic um, and understanding it well really teaches you a lot about both math and how this simple math actually describes the world so well, all right? We're gonna see in this topic, uh, we're gonna learn things that go from, uh, I don't know, like uh, door closers and how they work, how do they are. Sometimes there's this annoying door closer that takes forever to close the door, right? Sometimes there's this saloon doors kind of door closer that sucks, that the door goes like boom, 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 right? What we want is the door to just close the fastest possible without hitting it too hard, right? And without definitely, without oscillating. We're gonna learn about that and we're gonna learn about catastrophic resonance. You know these people that can sing and go like, oh, and break crystal, like glass, <laughs> like the, they break glasses and why is that? We're gonna learn about terms like natural frequency, resonant frequency. We're gonna learn about many misconce misconceptions that people have regarding the phenomenon of resonance and above all, catastrophic resonance, which in engineering is extremely important. People have screwed up big time due to fail, failing to account in for catastrophic resonance phenomena, how friction is related to that, and dissipation, like, you know, when you have this um, kind of like, I want to use energy, but then because I'm not efficient, there's dissipation, there's friction that dissipates in terms of heat, my energy, how that is generally bad, but sometimes it's not that bad. We will seal that with something as simple as the harmonic oscillator. So let's get to it. You can think of a very simple example of the harmonic oscillator as the one that you've studied in school, very likely, in, in high school, which is a mass tied to a spring. <laughs> when the mass is relaxed at position zero, this, is, this blue line is x equals zero. And uh, right, when you push it a little bit to the left, the spring push, pushes back towards equilibrium, maybe overshoots. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when I pull it to the x positive, the spring is gonna boom, pull me back. Yeah towards equilibrium, right? That's the elastic force. So this kind of, uh, of setup you've learned about in high school, and of course you can set up Newton's second law, which tells me that the sum of all forces acting on my mass is equal to the mass times the acceleration. Right, now, uh, in a differential equations course, we're a little bit more advanced than in your high school courses, so we write the acceleration as what it is, which is the second derivative with respect to time of the position, x, all right. Now, we write Newton's second law and say, okay, sum, uh, sorry, mass times acceleration is equal to the sum of all the forces acting on the mass. Let's see what those forces, uh, what those forces are. So we have first the elastic force. The elastic force is what I described, is the resistance that the spring puts towards moving this out of equilibrium. The spring really wants to keep the mass in equilibrium at x equals zero, but if you disturb it a little bit, the spring is going to react to that. So the reaction is governed by Hooke's law, Hooke's law tells me that the elastic force is minus k, where k is the elastic constant times x. Why the sign? Well, that means that if I pull the mass a little bit to the positive, the force of the spring mass is pulling me back, so it's negative towards the negative direction, the force goes in this direction. So yeah, minus kx, k is a positive constant, it's the elastic constant of the spring. And if I actually pull it this way or push it this way, the spring is gonna push back, and you see, if I move it to the x negatives, the spring is gonna make a force that tries to put in the positive, positive sign towards the right force. So this is the right sign, always opposing the distance to equilibrium. X is the difference from the position of equilibrium. All right, that's the elastic force. Um, so you see, we have, uh, probably in high school, they told you that you can think of the mechanical energy of the mass being equal to one half uh, m x dot squared kinetic energy, one half mass velocity squared, plus the elastic energy of the spring, right? Which is one half kx squared. And basically this tells you that 
Right. Uh, when I'm moving and oscillating in this, I'm basically I'm converting kinetic energy into elastic energy. I have zero elastic potential energy when I'm at equilibrium, but if I have some speed, I will start transforming that kinetic energy, going down into elastic energy, charging the spring, and then the spring stores the energy and puts it back into the mass and so on and so forth, right? Well, that's true as long as there is no friction. But no friction is unreal. There is always friction. And that friction is important. And we will discuss actually how important, because it's very important in engineering. For good reasons and for bad reasons. And by that I mean friction could be good or bad. So because we have friction, friction dissipates, friction tells me that energy is not going to be conserved. In the end, the mass is going to stop motion because friction is going to slow it down and dissipate that energy in terms of heat. So let's erase this equation right now because we don't have a frictionless harmonic oscillator. We're going to consider a positively friction harmonic oscillator. The friction force is proportional to the velocity for small velocities. Friction, friction is actually exciting. As in studying the physics, why the hell there's friction and how does it depend on the motion and how does it depend on everything is super, super exciting, super interesting. We're not going to get into that. But if it's friction that comes from uh, sliding on a surface, uh, for small velocities, that friction is proportional to the velocity. So the faster you go, the more friction you have. You know that with a car, right? With a car, the faster you are, the more friction you have. With a car, actually, at the beginning, when the car is low, it's proportional to velocity. When the car starts going faster, then the friction is not just uh, the friction of the, that the wheels have with the, with the ground. It's also uh, aerodynamic friction. And aerodynamic friction, when the, when the velocity is large enough, starts going like the square <laughs> of the velocity. It's super, it's super interesting how that happens. I'm not going to get into that because that's physics. That's actually called fluid dynamics. Those of you who have an interest in fluid dynamics, you know, you can get super rich in Apple knowing fluid dynamics. That's how actually Apple in cooling the, you know, Apple computers like the I iMacs, they don't really have super powerful fans for the same power, for the same amount of power. Uh, PCs usually need way more fans. How is that? Well, two reasons. They throttle for sure. Thermal throttling is a thing. But also, they're using thermodynamics and expansion of gases and how the fluids move inside the, inside the, the computer to cool down. They actually have the shape so that they, the air gets really hot and then undergoes an, an expansion and that expansion cools it down. Again, these are topics I'm just motivating you. If you ever want to study thermodynamics and fluid dynamics together, you will become really good engineers doing that. <laughs> it will help your engineering skills. Not only give you a better understanding about the universe, but improve your engineering skills. All right, end of paid promotion. <laughs> so back to this, friction. Very cool stuff. We're not going to tell exactly what the microscopics of friction is, but we're going to use that for low velocities. Friction goes proportional to the, to the velocity. So this thing, uh, this coefficient that we call here um, the friction coefficient, gamma, uh, it's makes it, it, tells, it tells you that the friction is proportional to the velocity. And there's a minus sign. What does that mean? Well, friction always opposes motion. If I'm moving this way, friction goes that way. If I'm moving this way, friction goes that way. So always negative sign with respect to the velocity. All right. And finally, we could have an external force. An external force is my hand moving it like that, or it could be a swing, and I could be pushing the swing. The external force is the push in the swing. The external force is uh, whatever we apply to the mass to move it and perturb it outside of equilibrium. All right, so we have to tolerate for possible external forces. We will study cases where there's no external force and cases with external force. And when you have external forces and those external forces are oscillating, we will talk about the phenomenon of resonance, <laughs> which is pretty cool. All right, so, uh, wonderful. We can write the equation of motion substituting the elastic force, the friction force, and the external force by its expression. So the equation of motion, Newton's second law, that's what we call the equation of motion, is mx dot dot, so sum of sum mass times acceleration equals sum of all the forces. K minus x, the elastic force, minus gamma x dot, the friction force, plus, let me call it um, F uh, tilde X as a function of T, which is the external force that I apply to the mass. This is me pushing it, right? 
So this one comes from the strain, this one comes from friction, this is me pushing the mass. All right, let's write this equation of motion in standard form, if you don't mind. In standard form, we're gonna write this as follows. X dot dot equals, uh, sorry, X dot dot plus twice, I'm gonna write here psi, that letter, omega, X dot. This letter, uh, my handwriting is not the best for that. If I try to do it properly, it would be like that. Psi omega X dot. Uh, and then plus omega square x equals, let me call this f of t without a tilde. Okay, so I went from here to here. How? Well, I divided by the mass and I defined the following quantities. I define where I define the following quantities. So three quantities. Maybe I'll, I'll write it here uh, where. I define first omega. We're gonna call this is square root of k divided by m, right? Uh, this omega and this you see it here. Actually, comparing these two terms, this omega you put this on that side of the equation, the equality you get a plus, and then you substitute k by omega squared. So omega is the square root of k divided by m. This is larger than zero, is the positive square root, and we call it is the natural frequency frequency of the oscillator. Now, this is just a definition I made. We will see why we call it, we have a reason. So for now, I told you as definition, but we have a reason to call it natural frequency that we will see in a minute when we actually solve the equation of motion, solve this differential equation and find the motion of the harmonic oscillator, of the oscillating mass. And we will see that this factor omega, the natural frequency of the oscillator, plays a role, okay? And, and it's a role that is a frequency, so if you do the units, it's a frequency, so it's related to frequency of something that oscillates perhaps, we'll see. For now, we just call it natural frequency, that factor. Then we have psi uh, equals, so by definition, we call it, it's uh, gamma divided by two m omega, larger than zero, is the, what we call the damping ratio. The damping ratio or damping factor All right, the damping ratio, damping factor tells you, it's kind of telling you how much energy in a way you dissipate per oscillation. It's like how much of, you know, per, 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 per oscillation that you do, per cycle of energy, per, per conversion of kinetic energy into elastic energy when we compress and extend the spring, how much energy actually we're dissipating in a way. And not exactly that, but that's the idea it gives you. It's dividing something that is the strength of the friction force divided by something related with the frequency of oscillations, okay? We will understand it better uh, a little bit later, but this is what we call the damping ratio. This is the scale of how fast um, the motion, the energy is lost in a way, and we, and we will see that explicitly. Uh, finally, what we call f of t, which is nothing but f tilde of t, f tilde external, what we call external of t, divided by the mass, that we call is the reduced external force, also called the specific external force, external acceleration if you want even, it's the external force divided by the mass on which I'm applying the force. All right, so these are definitions. And under these definitions, the equation of the harmonic oscillator becomes this one. Now, notice that we know how to solve this. This is a second order linear ODE of constant coefficients with perhaps an, um, an inhomogeneity if there's an external force. If there's no external force, no inhomogeneity. All right. Well, we know how to solve this equation. 
Let's solve the harmonic oscillator and let's see what kind of physics we get, shall we? All right, so let's analyze the phenomenon of free oscillation. Before doing that, one quick note. Often in engineering and in physics sometimes, instead of the damping ratio, which is psi, it's used what was called the quality factor of the, of the oscillator, also called the Q factor. That is just one over two psi, uh, where psi is the damping ratio. Okay, so they're related, it's one to one. Giving you the Q factor gives you the damping ratio. All right, that said, let's analyze the behavior of a harmonic oscillator when I just release it from equilibrium, so I, maybe I pull it like that, but I don't do any forces, I just release it. No forces, there's no external force. I'm not pushing anymore, I'm letting it go. So maybe your intuition is that um, this uh, block of mass will move boom, 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 a little bit and then oscillate and then stop or something like that, right, because of friction. Let's see if that's the case. All right, so we need to solve this equation. And if we need to solve this equation, well, we know. Step one, or only step because this is homogeneous, is, okay, characteristic polynomial. The characteristic polynomial is lambda squared plus two psi omega lambda plus omega squared. Okay, let's find the roots. Now, the roots are very easy. Uh, the roots, we just uh, apply the quadratic formula, so lambda is equal, so that divided by two is minus b, which is minus two psi omega plus minus the square root of four psi square omega square minus four omega square, right? All right, so uh, if we simplify that, we can actually divide by two. If we divide by two, we cancel the four in here, four in here, we cancel the two in here. We can actually uh, get an omega. This is not a three, eh? of course, this is psi. All right, uh, we can factor an omega out. So let's see, lambda uh, one, two, one and two, it's equal to, we have three options, minus omega, multiplying psi plus minus square root of psi squared minus one. This is if psi is larger than one. If psi is larger than one, then this is a real number, and the square root of a real a positive number, the square root of a positive number is a real number. So we have two, this is two real roots, right? Two simple real roots. Another option we could have is just minus omega, and this is if uh, psi is exactly equal to one. If that's the case, we have only one root, uh, because well, it's minus omega psi, if you want, but psi is one in this case, so it's just minus omega. So in this case, we have a double, yeah, here we have a, a double real root, only one. And finally, the other option is omega uh, psi plus minus i, and then square root of one minus psi squared, if psi is less than one. If psi is less than one, then uh, this number becomes a negative number. So is the root of a negative number, I take the i and change the sign of it. So is i the root of the positive number that you get changing the sign? So it's this expression right here. And this is a, a pair of simple, complex, conjugate roots. Now, what does that tell you? The physics of what an oscillator will do depends a lot on the damping ratio, depends on how much friction it's got. This is super interesting, because if we write the solutions, uh, we can write, so in this case, remember, we're gonna have the solutions. Uh, in this, let's call this case, uh, for example, this one. Let's call this case one. Let's call this one case two. And let's call this one case three. And let's analyze them independently. Because remember, sometimes we're gonna get sine and cosine functions, but sometimes we may get exponentials, remember? 
And that is kind of funny. Exponentials without sines and cosines? Are you telling me that things with a spring, when I release them from equilibrium, maybe they never oscillate? Maybe they don't go like that? Maybe. And that's what you get in, in door closers. The door goes like, or in the, when you want to a morning weight, when you want to dampen oscillations in a car. So you have a system that dampens oscillations, right? All right, we will talk about that. And I will do a little demonstration with the computer as well to see, to see what's going on. But for now, let's solve the three different cases independently, shall we? It's not too difficult. Let me erase the board. All right, so case one. Case one, remember, is when the, the damping ratio is less than one. So you're not dissipating a lot of energy per cycle. You, you're dissipating energy slower than the ratio of conversion between, between uh, elastic potential energy and kinetic energy. You're converting all the time when you move in a, in a spring, right? In a harmonic oscillator, you are converting uh, elastic energy into, into kinetic energy, potential energy in the spring into kinetic energy of the velocity that the mass has. And you're doing that in this case much faster this conversion than the speed at which you are dissipating energy out of the system due to friction. That's what it means to have a, damp a, a damping ratio below one. Okay, so when you do that, remember the roots of the characteristic polynomial is a pair of complex conjugate roots. So the solution we know is an oscillating solution. It's sine, sine, cosine. In a way, we can actually write it. Uh, I'm going to write it using the alternative expression as a sine. So remember, I could write this. Let me just write it. x of t as sine, sine, cosine. Remember, it's the exponential of alpha t, so in this case is the exponential of minus omega psi t, and then that multiplies the cosine of, uh, oh my bad, this is not a minus, huh? cosine of omega root of 1 minus psi squared, right, t, this is a big group, thank you plus this a cosine plus b sine of omega root of 1 minus psi square t. All right. So remember that we can also write this alternatively in terms of the following. 1a constant e to the minus omega, or maybe I'll call it like psi omega t uh, times the sine of uh, theta t. So theta would be square root of 1 minus psi squared multiplied by omega t plus some constant delta. This is the one we're going to use for the harmonic oscillator. They're equivalent. You can actually find, so that constant, let's call this one a tilde. They're different constant and b tilde. You can write a as a function of a tilde and b tilde, and delta as a function of a tilde and b tilde. And we will actually do something similar in the future. Yeah? So you see how it's done, but I recommend you do it yourself. You can do it just with trigonometry. We will do it with a trick of complex calculus, which is much shorter. Now, look at this. The motion is, yeah, there are oscillations. The frequency of the oscillations is this one, right? It's square root of 1 minus psi squared omega. Remember, the frequency is what multiplies t. And there's also a dampening. You see, you're losing energy at each oscillation. There's an exponential. So basically, the curve, what you're going to do, if you start, say, at time 0, your x is equal to 5. So we start from 5. Then you're going to do there's an exponential decay that goes like that. But then you're going to be oscillating. You're going to be like doing. Being exponentially damped. That's what you're gonna be doing. So it's like a saloon, saloon doors. They will go like boom, poo, 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 poo. It's tip the typical image that people have with the spray. It goes like poo, and eventually ends. The ending is of course related to dissipation. Look that when psi is equal to zero, when there is no friction. The thing oscillates forever. If there were no friction, the thing stays like doo -doo 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 -doo. that's what I, I strictly LC circuit does that. LC circuit, you see, in the spring, you're converting kinetic energy into elastic energy and back into kinetic energy forever if there's no friction. In an LC circuit, you're converting electric energy, right? Electrostatic energy in the capacitor 
you're converting it into magnetic energy in the inductor and going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. In that uh, magnetic energy, electric energy, inductor, uh, capacitor, inductor, capacitor. If you put a resistor there, then the resistor is going to dissipate in terms of heat the energy, same as the friction in a spring. Okay? Look how cool this is in terms of explaining nature with really simple models. All right, wonderful. So if you have an LC circuit, capacitor, capacitor, inductor, capacitor, inductor, if you have a resistor, it dissipates really fast, exponentially fast. And uh, the time at which it dissipates is the inverse of omega psi. So at a scale of inverse of omega psi, it, the energy is going to be dissipated exponentially. Hmm, interesting. Now, another interesting thing, the frequency of oscillations, frequency of free oscillations. The frequency of, of free oscillations, let's call it, what should we call it? Let's call it omega 3, is square root of 1 minus psi squared omega. That's the frequency of free oscillations. Now, if, they were, if there were no friction whatsoever, so if no friction, which means psi equals zero, then the frequency of free oscillations is equal to omega, which is what we call the natural frequency of the oscillator. So the natural frequency of the oscillator is not the frequency of free oscillations, is the frequency of free oscillations if there were no friction. That is the natural frequency of the oscillator. In an LC circuit, it would be one over the root of LC. Anyway, the, this is important because when people, people talk in popular science, they talk about the resonance frequency, the natural frequency, and how when you match it, you have resonance. That's not true. We will actually see the exact thing, uh, but you see that the natural frequency, omega, is the frequency of free oscillation when you hit the oscillator and let it go if there were no friction. If you can neglect the friction, that is the frequency um, of the oscillator. If friction is small, the natural frequency is equal to the, if it's small actually, if it's zero, it's equal to the frequency of free oscillation. But it's not the same. Alrighty, if you have frictions, the frequency of free oscillations, which is that number here, is different from the natural frequency omega. All right? Okay, hopefully we understood the notion of natural frequency. Natural frequency, right, right, that's the frequency the oscillator would actually oscillate if there were no friction. I would ask any questions. This is a typical point that we have a lot of discussions and we talk a little bit about quantum stuff and we talk a little bit about how this plays, this plays into explaining nature. I hope that we can do that in our discussion sessions in person. I'm looking forward to that. But for now, we've understood it. Okay, this regime, if friction is not large, so actually, if friction is small enough that the conversion between, um, uh, uh, between el elastic and kinetic energy happens faster than the dissipation, then we get oscillations that are exponentially damped. All right? Let's see the other cases. In fact, we're gonna see now, which one I'm gonna see now? Uh, I'm gonna see actually case three. I'm gonna see the overdamped oscillator because it makes more sense and it's more fun. All right, so yeah, allow me to jump to what I call case three. I know that some of you may be like, what? But it's, I think, way better to talk about underdone than overdone than the one in the middle of the two, which we'll see what it is because it's exciting. So please, bear with me. All right, in the case of the overdone post later, we have the damping ratio much larger than one. That means that I'm dissipating energy faster than the conversion between, elast uh, between uh, kinetic and elastic energy. Let's see what happens in that case. So we have high friction, if you want. So in this case, uh, the solution, you see we have the root of the characteristic polynomial, our two real roots, is just exponentials. So the solution is of the form C1 e to the minus psi plus psi minus one, psi squared minus one omega t plus C2 e to the minus psi minus root psi squared minus one omega t. So that is what the harmonic oscillator is going to do in this case. What is it going to do? Huh. Both solutions are killed 
for large times. <laughs> Both solutions are killed for large times. Um, we will see. I mean, like, actually, we're going to see it in a computer. I'm going to plot in a computer so you see it. But what you get is that no matter how you start, the harmonic oscillator is exponentially killed for times long enough. What? Are you telling me that the friction is too large? The thing doesn't even get to do one oscillation? Yes, I'm telling you. You pull this and the mass goes like and stops there. Like a door closer. <laughs> a door closer dissipates all the energy before one oscillation is made. That's what happens when you get uh, damping ratios so high. So if you were deciding, so you can have a spring that never oscillates. All the energy is dissipated before a single cycle is completed and you go back to equilibrium without crossing x equals zero. Uh, all right. Well, this is this would be time, right? Well, then imagine, so the overdamped oscillator dies exponentially fast. Now my question would be, okay, I want to design some machine that when I'm closing the door, it dissipates the energy as fast as possible. That's the same in a car, I don't want vibrations, I want some machine, some spring that dissipates all the energy before doing oscillation because I don't want to go like that in the car. I want to be steady in the car when I hit a bump on the road or something, right? So, um, when you design machines that are more um, like suppressed vibration, any vibration suppression, you want to have um, something that is not underdone. But then you may think, okay, what I need to do is dissipate energy as fast as possible, right? The more done, the better. Is that right? Maybe not. Because maybe what you're doing, I put it here, I'm dissipating energy so far that, you know, I start with some potential energy. I transform it into kinetic. I move a bit. But that's dissipated. Now you have no speed. All right, now I need to start converting again my mechanical energy into kinetic. I move a bit. I dissipate it. So I never let the thing get faster. So dissipating too fast is bad. I want the thing to gain some speed before dissipating so it can get to x equals zero. I want to transform more efficiently mechanical energy, um, um, potential energy into kinetic energy. So maybe overdamping is not the solution. Maybe there's a perfect amount of damping that dissipates all the energy in a single oscillation but, you know, letting the thing get as fast as you can without having to do oscillations. That is the case when you dissipate energy as fast as the conversion of mechanical energy into kinetic energy, but not faster. Yeah, probably you guessed it already. That's going to be the case of uh, psi equals one. That's what we call the, the critically damp oscillator. <laughs> so in the case of the critically damp oscillator, actually, I'm going to put an exclamation point. Uh, case one and case two are the only ones that you can safely put an exclamation point on because two factorial is two, one factorial is one, whatever. Right. So critically down postulator. Now the roots of the characteristic polynomial is a double real root omega, which means that we have the exponential of minus omega t times a polynomial. So in this case, this is the solution. And I'm telling you that perhaps this is the fastest way of getting a system that is attached to a spring to dissipate all the energy and get back to equilibrium in the, in the fastest time possible. We're gonna see this with a computer simulation and we're gonna do it now. All right, before we get to the computer to run the simulations, we need to solve an IDP. We need to set up what our physical problem is gonna be that we're going to simulate. In particular, I want to grab the mass in the harmonic oscillator and pull it from equilibrium on amount x0 and then release it with no initial velocity. That is an IVP, an initial value problem. I say that at time zero, the position is x0, I put it like that, and I release with no velocity. The velocity at time zero is equal to zero. Okay, those are the two initial conditions. I need two initial conditions for a second order equation because I need to know two constants, right? Delta and A in the case of underdamp oscillator. And uh, we need to impose this, solve this IVP, this equation with this initial condition for what we want to simulate again. I put it in amount x0 with no initial velocity. All right, let's do first the case of the underdamp oscillator, which is the most difficult of the three in terms of simplifying and doing arithmetics. Um, here I wrote an identity that you may not remember or not know. The sine of the arctangent of x is equal to x squared divided by the square root of x squared plus one. This is a very useful identity to solve things related with trigonometry and differential equations. All right, so, uh, because we need to impose the initial conditions to find a and delta on x and on x dot. I computed the derivative of x for the underdamped case. 
which is here is very easy, the A factors out. This is the derivative of the exponential times the sine without derivation. And this times this is the derivative of the sine times the exponential without derivation. Now, let's impose the initial conditions. First, we impose that x of 0 is equal to x0. So, if we substitute t by 0 in here, we get just a, this is a 1, the, the, this term is 0, so only delta, a sine delta equals x0, which means that a is equal to x0 divided by the sine of delta. All right, now let's impose that x dot of zero is equal to zero. Now imposing that, we do, let me substitute a by, already by x zero divided by the sine of delta. So what we do here is substitute. So we get that uh, this is minus psi omega, this is a one, the sine is only the sine of delta at t equals zero plus root of 1 minus psi square. Oh, that's psi. Psi square omega, this is a 1, and this is the cosine of your delta, equals to 0. All right, notice that we can divide by omega on both sides. We can divide by x0 on both sides. We can put the sine in and simplify. If we do that, we get minus psi uh, plus root of 1 minus psi square. Uh, times 1 over the tangent of delta, right? This is the cosine over the sine, 1 over the tangent, the cotangent, but I like to, one, to write 1 over the tangent, and that's equal to 0. All that I did is divide it by the sine both terms, and simplify the omega, simplify the x0, divide my omega and x0 on the left and on the right. Okay, so that means, I mean, I can simplify further by dividing both sides by psi, I mean, just... Uh, uh, for fun, so this is minus 1 plus the root of 1 over psi squared uh, minus, minus 1. I divide it by psi, I divide it by psi, multiply by 1 over the tangent of delta equals 0. And then that means that I solve that and I get that 1 over the tangent of delta is equal to uh, 1 over root of 1 over psi squared minus 1. What that tells me is that delta is the arc tangent. I invert both sides, right? The arc tangent of the root of 1 over psi squared minus 1. Wonderful. I go delta. Uh, we need to get a, but that's easy because I just need to substitute delta. So a is equal to x0 sine of the arc tangent of the root of 1 over psi squared minus 1. But we can use the identity that we have here to simplify the result. And the result that we get is that this is x0 divided by the square root of 1 minus psi squared. All right. So this is a, a is equal to x0 divided by the root of 1 minus psi squared. All right, fine, we, we solved the problem. Let's just write the solution. I'm gonna erase everything that I used to get that. And I'm gonna substitute, I'm gonna store it here. The solution for the underdone case is x of t equals substituting a x0 divided by root of 1 minus psi square e to the minus psi omega t sine of root of 1 minus psi square omega t plus the arc tangent of uh, root of 1 over psi square minus 1. Okay, this is the particular solution, this is the general solution, this is the particular solution in the underdone case, the particular solution that satisfies this initial condition, which I pull by a quantity x0. All right. Okay, so the thing that we need to do now is to write the same thing, but for the other two cases. Let's go with the overdone case now.
All right, let's impose the initial conditions. Remember, I pulled the mass at amount x0, release with no speed. Original at time 0 is x0, velocity at time 0 is 0. I already took the liberty for the overdamp case to compute the derivative. You see, this is the prefactor. You see, this is the prefactor, this is the derivative. Uh, now let's impose the initial conditions. There's some arithmetics that's going to go, but uh, following, I'm going to be relatively fast simplifying. So first we impose that x of 0 equals x0. That is very easy. That tells me that at time 0, the exponentials are 1, so it's c1 plus c2 equals x0. Or in other words, c1 is equal to x0 minus c2. Wonderful. Now, I impose the condition of the derivative, x dot of 0 equals 0. So that means that I have this thing with t equals 0, this identity, this identity equated to 0. Because it's equated to 0, I'm going to multiply both sides by minus 1 already. So we have c1 psi plus root psi squared minus 1 uh, plus c2 psi minus root of psi squared minus 1, uh, right, equals 0. Oh, you're forgetting the omega. Well, not really. I divided by omega both sides, okay? So it simplifies quite a bit because I have 0 on the other side. Okay, I can do a further simplification. Uh, to the dividing by this, and then I get c1 uh, plus c2, then multiplies the fraction, psi minus root, psi squared minus 1, psi uh, plus root of psi squared minus 1 equals 0. Now I can substitute c1, and if I substitute c1, I get x0 minus c2. Wonderful, this is C1. Okay, so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to come on factor, I'm going to put the x0 on the right, that's minus x0, okay? And I'm going to take a common factor of C2. So C2, that multiplies two things. First, the fraction, psi minus root, psi squared minus 1, divided by psi plus root, psi squared minus 1, minus 1, that's the common factor, equals minus x0. Maybe I'll write it smaller. Now notice that this simplifies quite a bit. If I take common denominator for this one, I get that this is c2 multiplying psi minus root psi squared minus 1, and then plus the denominator, so minus the denominator, psi minus root of psi squared minus 1, divided by the common denominator, psi plus root psi squared minus 1, right, equals to minus x0. And notice how uh, this cancels this. So what I'm left with is minus twice this root, but the two minuses, I'm going to multiply by minus one both sides again. So I get uh, C2 multiplying twice the root of psi squared minus one divided by psi plus psi squared minus one. All right, equals x0. All right, now I can divide, I can divide by the root. Let's just simplify, this is just simplifying a bit. So uh, if I divide by the root, I get C2 twice uh, psi divided by the root of psi squared minus one plus one equals x zero. I can further simplify this, C2, two, and then divided by psi, numerator and denominator here, I get 1 over root of 1 minus 1 over psi squared plus 1 equals x0. So what I get in the end is that c2 is equal to x0 divided by 2 multiplied by 1 over the root of 1 minus 1 over psi squared plus 1. That's the constant C2. And for the constant, constant C1, it's pretty easy because we have this relationship here. C1 is equal x0 minus C2. So we substitute it, and we get that C1 is equal to x0, common factor of 1 uh, minus uh, 1 half of 1 root of 1 minus 1 over psi squared plus 1. Now, the 1 minus 1 half give me, gives me a positive 1 half, 
and uh, I can take the one half factor out. So I get that C1 is going to be equal to F0 divided by two. And then I get a one minus one over root of one minus one over psi squared. All right, and that is the constant C2, a C1, okay? All right, so that with the two constants, we can write the particular solution. This is the general solution of the problem. The particular solution that satisfies that you pull it out x0 and you release with 0 t in the overdone case. So we substitute the constant x of t, then the common factor x0 over 2, and that multiplies first c1, which is 1 minus 1 over root of 1 minus 1 over psi squared. Uh, multiply, I multiply the exponential of minus psi plus root of psi squared minus 1 omega t. And now the other constant c2, which is uh, 1 plus 1 over root of 1 minus 1 over psi squared. Uh, multiplying, or well, it's a plus, of course, multiplying the exponential of minus psi minus root psi squared minus 1 omega t. And this is the solution for psi larger than 1, the over damped case. All right, so uh, let's do the critically damped one. All right, so we have here the critically damped one. That's what you get when psi is equal to 0 and you simplify. Let's impose the initial conditions again. We pull an amount x0 and we release without speed. So pulling an amount x0, x of 0 is equal to x0, which means, again, this is a 1 when t is 0, and this is a 0. That directly tells me that c1 equals x0. Look how easy in this case. <laughs> we already have c1. All right, let's find c2. So we equate x dot of 0 to 0. What we get is this is a 1, so minus omega, and then uh, that multiplies only c1 because there's a t in here and t is 0. c1 is x0, so let's write an x0 in here already. Plus, there is a 1, c2 equals 0. So that tells me directly that c2 is equal to omega x0. As simple as that. So in this case, the solution is really easy. And the solution in the critically damped case is just uh, we can take a common factor x0 um, because c1 and c2 are both x0. So it's x0 that multiplies e to the minus omega t. And that multiplies uh, 1 plus omega t. And this is the critically damped case. Oops, I don't need the box here, I'm not doing boxes. All right, so we have now, and this is one is even super easy to check. When x is zero, uh, then this is zero. And uh, what I get is this is one, is equals to x zero. So it satisfies the initial condition. And then the derivative, if you put it here, so if you put it here, the derivative of this one, it's, let's just do a quick check on that one because it's super easy. X of t in this case is x0 minus omega e to the minus omega t times 1 plus omega t plus, and now the derivative of the other one, so x0 e to the minus omega t omega. So what happens when t is 0? When t is 0, this is a 1, this is 0. So we get minus omega uh, plus uh, x0 omega plus x0 omega, so this is 0. Quick check, we got it right. I mean, all of them are right and tested, but this one, this is the kind of test that you can do when solving assignments. Check it that your result is correct. Anyway, we have found now the particular solutions, right, of the uh, under damp oscillator, over damp oscillator, and critical damp oscillator that satisfy that when I pull a quantity of 0 and release with no speed, satisfy those conditions. Now, what we have to do is we're going to go to the computer and we're going to plot the behavior of these solutions and we're going to compare the physical regime, the different physical regimes, underdamped, overdamped, and critically damped. 
Let's go to the computer. All right, we are ready to do the numerical simulation and we're gonna do it in Mathematica. So as you can tell here, I wrote in Mathematica the functions, the same functions that we had in, uh, in our, the, 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 the solutions to the IVP, where I demanded that the oscillator, I pull it an amount x0 over equilibrium and I release with no speed. These are the constants that we computed in the previous, well, in the video, in the same video right before. And uh, as you can tell, I have here the overdam case, the critically dam case, and the underdam case. Now, notice that I singled out the case of zero friction, and I wrote it explicitly, and you may be thinking, you are cheating, right? Because this one should actually cover also psi equals zero. Why do you say, why do you put it uh, independently? Well, when psi is equal zero, the computer uh, actually may encounter some zero over zero and indeterminations, and those zero over zero indeterminations, the computer doesn't really know what to do with it. In particular, right, they would have a problem here. But you can tell that we can take the limit, you can do the limit of this expression when psi goes to zero with Taylor series, as you should. You can do it with L'Hopital, um, it's okay. And you can actually do it with Wolfram Alpha or Mathematica because they take limits <laughs> and you can tell that the limit is exactly what I wrote. So this is just to prevent the computer making uh, numerical evaluations of one over zero. The computer doesn't know if it's zero times one over zero. The computer does first the one over zero and said, oh, error, I don't know how to do that. So I substitute it by the expression that is, uh, you get in the limit. Okay, you may have guessed that this is the right solution uh, already, but if not, you can do the limit of the underdump case when the size is zero, and then you get that expression. I just wrote it explicitly here. All right, so we evaluate this function, and now we are ready to plot it. Now, let's plot it. So we run this command, and what we have here it's uh, the parameters. We can actually set the parameters for the simulation. Uh, let's set the frequency to one. And you see that no friction, but also no elongation. I haven't pulled x0 is zero, it's in equilibrium. So what it does, this is time the x-axis and the y-axis is uh, the amplitude. As you can tell, if you start zero amplitude, nothing happens. But if you start pulling the spring, you see what happens, right? It starts oscillating, that's 1.63. This, you start here with all potential elastic energy, you release, then part of that energy gets transformed into kinetic energy. When it reaches the equilibrium, the spring is not compressed, so there is no potential energy storage there. It's all in kinetic energy. But then here, it compresses the spring again. When it's here, it's all again in potential energy, then all kinetic, all potential, all kinetic, all potential. So you see in the transformation between kinetic energy and potential energy of the time. Potential at the extremes, kinetic when it reaches zero. Uh, if it were an LC circuit, uh, uh, you would have here, so this is the, 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 um, the pass, the transmission between uh, electric energy uh, and magnetic energy in the capacitor versus the inductor. Okay? All right. So now uh, let's start adding some friction to the problem. If we add some friction, look what happens. Let's increase the frequency to see even better. So if we add friction, what we get is that the amplitude, you start with all potential energy, all kinetic energy, all potential energy, all kinetic, all potential, but every cycle you're losing a little tiny bit. And actually it's not a tiny bit, it's pretty fast. You are decaying exponentially, as you see. So when you're under them, you get oscillations, but decaying exponentially fast. This is the, the saloon doors, right? You push them and go like, woo, 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 Or the typical image that people imagine where they actually pull um, uh, the, the, the mass and the spring gets compressed and goes like boom, 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 and then stops. So this is exactly that case, the underdamp case. Let's see what happens when we go all over damp. Look at that. When you go all over damp, what's happening is you start with all mechanical energy, then starts transforming into kinetic, but the moment it transforms into kinetic, gets dispersed, gets dissipated, not dispersed. Uh, due to friction, in, I and mean, the energy is lost in terms of heat, in the form of heat. So this energy is being lost as you go, and you can tell that it's sluggishly losing energy. Oh, a little bit more mechanical into kinetic, lost, a little bit lost. It's not really gaining speed, so it's actually the more you dampen it, the more friction it is, the slower it gets. This is an annoying door closer in the winter, that the door takes forever to close, and then you get cold and you get mad. 
So let's see what happens when we get to the, you see, when we get to the limit of critically damping. Critically damping, dampening happens at exactly one. So you see, at one, this is the fastest, the fastest that it gets to zero. This is an optimal door closer. If you want to dissipate, if you want to do, uh, I don't know, you want to do, uh, you go in a car and you want an, a dampening system that absorbs all the bumps really fast, then you have to critically damp. If you want a door closer that is fast, but doesn't oscillate, doesn't do the saloon effect, goes like and close in the smallest amount of time, this is what you have to do. Because actually, if you go less than that, you get oscillations. Critically damp is when you actually lose the oscillations. Let's do it a little more. Critically damping is when you lose the oscillations and then have the minimum amount of time to get to zero without crossing the axis. All right, so those are all the regimes we studied in class. It's fun to work and play with the different regimes. So what happens when you increase the frequency of the oscillator when it's damped? Well, when it's under damp, it's kind of clear. You increase the number of oscillations, right? But you also, you see that you also die earlier. It makes sense. The more you oscillate, the more cycles between mechanical and kinetic energy, sorry, between uh, potential and kinetic energy you're going through, transformations, and every cycle you dissipate. <laughs> so uh, the faster your oscillator is, the faster it dissipates. This explains, for example, why uh, high-pitched sounds, how high-pitched sounds get don't get through walls as well as the as the as the as the bass, right? The bass. Bass uh, actually goes through walls, goes through obstacles so easily. It's not damped easily in media that is dissipative because of the frequency. Anyway, this is very rough. I mean, of course, all, this is a very simple model, but I think it illustrates pretty well the physics of um, uh, oscillations and uh, dissipation in terms of heat when you have friction in the system. Keep in mind, this is the free oscillator. The next thing we're gonna study is the driven oscillator. And it, it gets really interesting because we're gonna study the phenomenon of resonance. But that will be in the next video. I'll see you there. Until then, don't panic. And always bring your towel.